All right. Well, welcome, everyone. I'm Dr. J.D. Armstrong. I'm the Maui Technology Education and Outreach Specialist here at the uh, University of Hawaii Institute for Astronomy, Haleakala Division. And I think that that should be the next talk is just that, what I said. Um, it's long enough. So uh, we're today, today's speaker is Jim Mayo, and he is uh, an optics designer. Um, he's been building telescopes since he was 12 years old. Um, and at 15, joined the uh, Memphis Astronomical Society. Um, he uh, went on to get his Bachelor in, of Science in Physics at the University of Tennessee. And then he started working with the Air Force, and he's worked with NASA and this place and that place uh, uh, as, as an opt optics expert. And um, then he went on to attend um, the Optical Sciences Center, where he earned his Master's of Science in Optical Sciences. Um, again, several more uh, jobs uh, with all the places that you want to be. And in 2010, he joined um, Tau Technologies as the chief optics engineer. And his recent emphasis has been on lightweight and transportable telescopes and uh, uh, next generation optics and things like that. And so we're very fortunate to have somebody with his expertise here. So let's give him a nice Maui welcome. Well, well thank you, JD. It's a pleasure and honor to be here and to see uh, a few faces that I actually know and have had the pleasure and honor to work with, and some new faces that I hope to be able to present some material that you might find interesting. Um, uh, as J.D. said, I joined the Astronomical Society when I was 14 or 15. I was on the board of directors of the Memphis Astronomical Society at the age of 16, which was kind of young. Loved it and went on to become the first graduate of the Optical Sciences Center in 68, and have worked with astronomy people all over the world. Now, uh, this is kind of a history talk. It's not super technical. It's kind of in the middle, technical point here and there, and then some some uh, informational stuff about the historical development of telescopes and astronomy. Um, I, I hope you enjoy that. I hope you like that. And since this is an astronomical group, I assume that everybody will enjoy hearing about the history of telescopes. Now, there, the history of telescopes has a history in itself because I first gave this talk when Henry C. King's book, History of the Telescope came out in 1955, and I got memorized that book and some other books, and I loved it, and so I gave a talk at the Society in Memphis when I was about 15 or 16, and it went over okay. I think I had an easel with some grease pens or pencils and flipped, flipped them over. This was long before the invention of the laser or the computer. Well, anything small computers and big computers were kind of around with UNIVAC and whatever they were in those days, IBM back in the 40s and 50s. So uh, this talk has been given a lot of places. It's got a lot of versions. Uh, I can't even recall how many times I've given this talk. It's probably 40 or 50. It's been given in five or six foreign countries, and it's probably been given in 50 or 20 states. It's been given over here, and it was the invited keynote address for the, actually for the uh, Amos Conference here in 2001. And it was the morning of 9-11, and I was the first speaker. And, of course, we canceled that day because of the, of the terrible tragedy on that day. But I think that was the hardest time I've ever to get this talk was on the Thursday following 9-11. Very painful experience for me. I've been in the Air Force for 23 years, former head of the optics and being with the division at the Air Force Research Laboratory, um, working now with people like Joe and Scott and other dignitaries. And, again, I, I do want to thank the Institute for inviting me up. So, um, like I said, every historical talk has a history, and that's a little bit of the history of this talk. Last time I gave it, I think, it was the University of Naples, and I think my wife was there too, my wife Linda over here, and uh, and uh, we we, uh, we both like astronomy, but she doesn't get into it quite as much as I do. She hasn't built a telescope in years. But I think sometime between 53 and 54 and maybe 95, I built 40 or 50 scopes from 4 inches to about 20 inches, I built them myself ground polished, uh, tested, put the test equipment form, Foucault testers, Ronke testers before lasers were even around. So those of you who know telescopes and telescope making, I was an ATM nut going back um, actually 60, 65 years ago. Okay, I'm told to stay kind of in the light, um, blinded by the light, sounds like a song I heard back in the 60s. But um, I won't try to sing that for you, it might be a little bit embarrassing. Um, but uh, I'll try to stay in the light part of the time. I may rove over here occasionally and get out of the field of view. So those watching this from a far distance say, where in the hell did the speaker go? But 
I'll be here somewhere. Okay, oops, we got a, a blue screen. Oh, God, the blue screen of death is never good. So uh, uh, I got it up here. So sometime soon, uh, this, this will probably be turned to a regular screen with stuff on it. There we go. Okay, at 1080p, and we're, we're, we're in business. Now, I've given this talk so many times at government groups, Air Force groups, Navy groups. I don't think I've ever given Army group or Marine Corps group and NASA groups and other people. I've given it so many times that I put a disclaimer. I, I am not here on behalf of the, of, the, of the government or the military. I'm here on behalf of myself. I developed this talk over the years pretty much myself, and a few times when I was asked to give it somewhere, I may have gotten just a tiny bit of funding to redo the charts, and I have a, a graphics guy, I'm going to think at the end of this talk, a nice graphics guy does good work. And so I took out a lot of stuff and added some more stuff, so you'll find this, this uh, has uh, the latest version. But no matter how late a version it is, there are always going to be a few typos. And I'll always say at least one thing politically incorrect. I always do. I, I can't get away from that. No matter where I am, it's say something that, uh, that offends the Italians or the French or something. So uh, forgive me in advance for that, and you can come up and reprimand me after the talk. So let's move right along. And uh, the background was designed by myself and my graphics uh, artist, Pat Cavaney. Represent some telescopes in the, from history. You may recognize some of them. Um, this one over here is interesting because I think this may be the great Melbourne telescope, the last great spectral mirror telescope ever in the world uh, in Melbourne. It's, by the way, it's Melbourne, not Melbourne. If you ever go to Australia, you say Melbourne, they get all concerned. It's, it's Melbourne, uh, interestingly enough. And we did spend some time in, in Melbourne, so I was taught very quickly not to say Melbourne. Uh, anyway, moving right along. Um, uh, this is kind of the agenda. Uh, I have a, a, a say, I have a place for questions, so it doesn't say you can't ask questions, but it'd be probably smoother if we keep the questions in the in the question places. I have a question place in the middle, and you'll see it because it says "Ask Questions Now." And then after that, I have a question session at the end, and you may or may not have more questions, and I'll stay as long as you want. I'm never able to answer all the questions. When I was a 14 or 15 year old. Youngster, I ask questions that the astronomers couldn't answer, and I'm sure someone out here can do the same thing to me. So turnaround is fair play. But uh, I'll try to answer the questions if I can. And um, uh, again, I do this off of memory. I I'm not reading from a script, so hope I can recall a lot of this. But the ancients had some wonderful astronomy. Uh, we don't know much about it sometimes, but the Greeks and Romans wrote about it. And they even wrote about some of the things that the, uh, that the Egyptians did. And we'll talk about that a little bit. And then there are a lot of precursors that happened just before the telescope happened. Like computers, uh, when they exploded on the scene, you know, 40, 50, 60 years ago, uh, and the PC 30 years ago, whenever it was, uh, there were precursors that came along. So I'll talk about telescope precursors, too. And uh, they're very important to me because they said that people almost had the right idea. They were so close. They were just, just almost there, and they blew it. And I've done that, too. I've been so close. I'm sure Joe and Scott have. You're so close to a solution to a problem of some kind. You don't quite get it, and somebody else gets it 20 years later or something. And you say, I had that idea 20 years ago. So that's hindsight, and hindsight's always 2020. So uh, I'll talk about the way the telescope literally exploded into the scene, like computers did, sort of. And I'll tell you how that happened. Uh, I'll talk about the evolution of the telescope. And there are a lot of milestones I always point out because if you can't do certain things in making telescopes, building telescopes, testing telescopes, evaluating telescopes, using telescopes, you never get anywhere because you have to have milestones. And there are milestones for, for, for the Navy and the Army and the Air Force, and there are milestones for archaeologists, the King Tut thing in 1922. We got to visit that and go into the pyramid a few years ago. I actually had a full four-year scholarship in archaeology at the University of Chicago in 1958. turned down to become a physicist. Probably I turned down because of Sputnik in 1957. So... My life has been infected and, and influenced by, by lots of interesting things that have happened over the years, and I'll tell you about some of the things that happened to make telescopes the other day. Uh, now, there may not be time for this, but if there is, I, I took this talk that I gave as a keynote address for a DEPS conference a few years ago, and I toned it down because I had ray trace patterns and I had spot diagrams, and I took those out because there wouldn't be time to talk about them anyway. So uh, I am going to talk about taxonomy, and that's classification of scopes, what kind of scopes they are, mirror scopes, lens scopes, catadioptic scopes, catoptic scopes, dioptic scopes, scopes that are long, scopes that are short, scopes that are fat, scopes that are, you know, et cetera. So all these things are kind of neat. And then I'll talk about uh, mounts, drives, and controls if we have time. So it, it looks like those aren't going to be as interesting. 
uh, we can slow down on those and uh, if they're or, or speed up on those if they're going to be interesting I can run through those uh, at, at, at your at your leisure and your pleasure so my wife is mushing to me take a deep breath and slow down Someone might say my mouth can keep up my brain, but I think it's the other way around. My brain can keep up my mouth. But anyway, at this age, as I approach octogenarianism, neither the brain or the mouth work particularly well. So anyway, we'll move right along. And the uh, first topic is, I don't mean the ancients. And I like this field because, again, I like archaeology and ancient history. Uh, and I also put this up in one of my talks because I always remember George Santayana's comment in 1905 those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. There are several versions of this, uh, but I like this version as good as any. And uh, I always keep this in mind, so that's why I like these history talks. Uh, going back to Euclid, uh, he once said there's no royal road to geometry. And uh, that was said to Ptolemy I. This was before the, the Ptolemaic collapse at the time of uh, Caesar, Anthony, and Cleopatra in the Battle of Actium and Caesar's arrival in, in uh in Egypt, and you've probably seen Cleopatra, the movie. There's some factual stuff in there. And um, I thought that was a great quote because he told Ptolemy, you can't learn, you can't learn geometry overnight just because you're, you're a, a royal member of the court and you're, and you're the King Ptolemy. I can't teach you uh, geometry overnight, and there's no royal road to geometry. And then a Galileo quote from around 1610, and you can read that yourself, but I think it's a neat quote because he realized what the telescope was going to do eventually for astronomy and for science. And of course, I uh, visited the, I've been to Italy many times, visited the museum and saw Galileo's finger. Anybody else here seen Galileo's finger? It's actually preserved in, in Florence in a little jar, and you can go in and see his finger. And then the tombs there and all of that, but I, I got a great thrill from seeing his mummified finger sitting up there in the display case, along with some old telescopes. And then Kepler, who also was kind of a contemporary, you know, Kepler's laws, Kepler's three laws of planetary motion that apply to other things coming around the sun too. But uh, I won't try to quote those laws. I probably could only quote the first two anyway. But, uh, you know, O telescope, instruments knowledge, more precious than any scepter. So uh, he actually tied in um, uh, a scepter of a king or a priest or some such thing with the importance of the telescope. And then I, I made this, this, this quote in 2001, there's no role with the telescopes. I've been doing telescopes for 65 years, still don't understand all I'm, I could about them. Wish I knew more, but uh, I'm still learning. And as I approach, uh, and my wife and I approach 80 ish, uh, we're still learning lots of things, and then we're learning about telescopes too. Um, okay, uh, actually, I added this because I thought some people might be interested in, in Polynesian ocean navigation and astronomy. I don't know much about that field. But I do know that the Polynesian navigators were incredible. Now, why were they incredible? It was hard to navigate the Mediterranean. How big is the Mediterranean? It's one million square miles. How big is the Pacific Ocean? It's bigger. 60 some odd million, 65 million square miles. So in round numbers, navigating in the Pacific is 65 times more expansive than navigating the Mediterranean. So they did some wonderful things. They were kind of lucky because they came out of the out of the out of the Southwest Pacific and they moved upward, and uh, they they covered so many things three or four, five, six thousand years ago, which is amazing. It was actually about the time of the pyramids. They were being being navigating around the South Pacific, and uh, it's an amazing story. And they actually did the um, the navigation by looking at the stars and watching ocean currents. And what, what, what naturally existing animal did they watch also? They watched birds, and they watched whales, and they watched all sorts of things in the sea, and they told stories about it, and they relayed those stories on for generations and generations. They didn't write everything down in books, but the generational stories of the navigators that came to Hawaii a thousand years ago or more uh, are quite fascinating. I've read a little bit about that, but again, some of you may know about that, and I do, but bottom line is that they did some amazing things. Egypt, Babylonia, Phoenicia, and China were all amazing. Going back uh, two, three thousand years BCE, and uh, they were tidying with astronomy, religion, culture, calendars, pyramids, and temples. Uh, Egyptians actually had glass. The Egyptians could have built a telescope. They had glass three, three to five thousand years ago. They were using glass uh, and things called votive eyes, which are eyes and and statues and idols and 
and, and, and the king touched stuff. They had glass. And they had some wonderful gemstones too, lapis lazuli and various kinds of crystals. So they could have put two pieces of this together, made a little telescope, but they didn't because it just wasn't the right time in history. Uh, Phoenicians had some glass, and they actually had glass where they melted, they melted sand when they were cooking on the shores of the Mediterranean and other places around the world. And those melted sand made little glass blobs. Glass is just silica, SiO2. And so silica makes glass and one form of glass. They learned later to add other things to it and make lime glass. And so that all came later. Uh, and then there were instruments developed, the Marquette, the Norman, the Armillary, the Clipsidera, and others. And I'm not going to try to define all those. I can't remember what they are myself. But they were instruments that were used by the Egyptians and the Babylonians. It took the Egyptians in doing things many, 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 many millennia ago. And I have an example here, um, 2600 BC, BCE. And uh, this is an example, and this is kind of out of Henry C. King's book, but I modified it and did some animation. And this might have happened, uh, this is called a mastaba. Uh, mastabas preceded pyramids. They were little flat things without any tops. Somebody said, let's make them a little higher. Okay, and they went in a little further and a little further. And one day they got to the point and they said, we can't go any higher. We've got a pyramid. So pyramids happen. That, again, we, I've been to the Pyramid of Zulfur, the Step Pyramid, been to the Great Pyramid and all the pyramids, and I love pyramids. And actually, I did a little dissertation on pyramids when I was in college one time and got some extra credit for something I was doing. Uh, but anyway, um, you can suspect that at one time they were trying to line up on various stars. And again, they were very conscious of the helical rising of stars, which is the rising, the first rising you see of a celestial object when you haven't seen it for a long time. That, of course, will occur in the east, and the cosmic setting will occur in the west. And those are important because when the stars are down, and the navigators knew this, when stars are down near the horizon, you can tell the distance, the azimuth, which gives you the distance. When you're up in the air, you know, unless you have a sextant or an octant or a quadrant, you can't tell very well. So it's kind of important to keep that in mind. So um, they had to locate chambers and locate apexes and level these things out. Most leveling was done by water because water does what? It seeks its own level. And so you can do leveling with water because it seeks its own level. It's very nice. And the gravitational effects on uh, something the size of a pyramid are probably measured in micro inches. So it's very good level. Um, and then later on, uh, I, I commented that the... Uh, this guy missed the three, four, five triangle session. So the Egyptians knew about the three, four, five triangle 2,000 plus years before Pythagoras. But again, it didn't get published so much. Um, and over here we have a, a guy saying, I'm, I haven't, I'm not cleared on three, four, five triangles. I haven't been briefed on that. I don't have a clearance for that. It didn't in my, it isn't in my, my security clearance description. So he's confused, and then the guy behind him is uh, going to make the firing. He's moved his arm. He's missed the star, and uh, he had mislocated the king's chamber. Uh, his head will probably roll, and now another oops. So I have another history, historical oops, and I have a few more of these. Uh, there's a story in the Bamboo Annals of China about two astronomers named Ho and Hai, or if you prefer, Ho and He. We don't know much about them, but they go back 4,000 years ago. But it's written up in, in, in the actual Chinese annals. I actually read a copy of that translated one time years ago, and it, it's all kind of there somewhere. And um, they're out looking at, at eclipses. And, uh, of course, this is not a telescope. This is a pointing device. But they used pointing devices like that three and four and 5,000 years ago. And it wasn't just Tycho Brahe who did this at his observatory at Uraniborg and made these wonderful measurements of the positions of stars, measurements to an arc minute, 20 arc seconds, amazing, amazing accuracy, pre-telescope accuracy. But they, they did things with pointing devices, looked kind of like this. And so I guess uh, he decides to break off. He's seen enough eclipses. You know, what's, what's going to happen? No big deal. And then um, Hi or he says, uh, yeah, Emperor never missed one eclipse more or less. So that's what they said at the time. And then they just started to not count for things. And then all of a sudden, they notice something happening, and oops. So um, the history says that these two astronomers were published, or rather were punished by military expedition, which probably means uh, troops went there and lopped off their heads because the emperor didn't know about the eclipse beforehand. So 4,000 years ago, the Chinese were predicting eclipses, and that's pretty amazing to me. That's a long time ago. Uh, now, this picture I made in the Glyptotech in Munich, 
back about 2000 when I gave a talk at Munich. It wasn't this particular talk. It was a talk with NASA, but I, I made this picture at the Glyptotech, and I, I liked it, so I stuck it in there. And the Glyptotech, of course, is the big statuary hall in Munich, along with the Antique and Solomon Dungeon, which is the big museum there of antique stuff. There's also a Glyptotech in Copenhagen, which is a very nice place, too. But I made this, this picture when I was in, in Munich, and I stick it in occasionally. Uh, the Greeks and the Romans were very famous for their work in astronomy in the early days. Of course, they didn't have any telescopes. But I won't go through all these guys, but um, in the early days, Thales, and I've been to, to the, city of, the ruined city of Miletus, uh, the flat dick, disc, disc earth concept, eclipses, uh, cylindrical floating earth, stars fixed in rotating sphere. Pythagoras, of course, he liked harmonious relationships, so you can only imagine astronomy in the sky as being very harmonious. It had to, he knew some kind of laws. He didn't know what they were, but he knew there were laws of some kind there. And so, of course, the Pythagorean theorem is familiar to all of us from, from high school geometry. And then uh, one, uh, uh, Philolos, believed there was a counting, counter-rotating Earth. He had an idea kind of, of counterbalancing. So he thought the sun was here and the Earth was here and over behind was another dark body. You never see that because it was behind the sun. You can never see it. And then uh, Heraclides thought the sun rode around a spherical Earth and Mercury and Venus rotated around those objects. And then we go on, Plato, Aristotle, philosophical astronomy. Uh, I always like this guy here, Eratosthenes, because he actually calculated the diameter of the Earth. Which is amazing to me, you know. Here's a guy, it's 2,500 years ago, 2,300 years ago, sitting a stick in the ground in Greece and a stick in the ground in Alexandria, and noticing the shadows weren't the same. Now, how he got the communication, he didn't have one of these gigahertz communication systems, but somehow or other, they actually measured the distances, and he concluded that the shadows were longer, and and down here, and actually, close closer to the sun, it'd be a little longer up in Greece, and they were in Alexandria, Alexandria south of where he was in Greece. And so he did the calculation using Pythagorean geometry and actually came up with the conclusion that the Earth had a diameter of about, about 8,000 miles. So he sort of estimated the diameter of the Earth uh, 2,300 years ago, which I find it just totally amazing. And then there, there were, of course, great library in Alexandria, which was burned up in the time of Caesar. And the burning of the, uh, Alexandria's library is one of the most tragic things in history. And recently we had a big fire. Where was that deer? Was that in um, Rio or... The Rio, the Rio Museum, so the Rio Archaeological Museum had a fire, and uh, that's a terribly, th terribly bad thing down there. Uh, we were at Rio a couple of times, didn't make the museum, but it's an interesting city. And of course, Ptolemy, now what did Ptolemy do? This, this particular, there are a lot of Ptolemies. This was a Ptolemy in the first century a AD or CE, and uh, he actually devised a magnitude scale, which is still used today. Zero, one, two, three, four, five. We're looking for things at twentieth magnitude all the time, and that's that's neat stuff. So that's still attributable to Ptolemy. And you do the fifth root of hundred, you get two point five one two, I guess, and you multiply that by to the fifth power, you get hundred, and so that's why we have those classifications zero to to uh, to, to sixth magnitude. Um, actually, we know there were glass globes and water spheres, and there's talk about about uh, burning lenses and mirrors. Again, this is the time of Archimedes. And so uh, we went to, was it two years ago? We were in um, Italy and Sicily, and I went to Syracuse, and Linda went someplace else, Tiramina or somewhere. And I wanted to stand just, if I could, where, you know, where Archimedes stood when the Romans invaded uh, in around 212 B.C. I think one first said it was 211 B.C., but that's pretty close, B.C.E. So um, actually, I think the Roman fleet leader may have been Marcellus. Or Clavius, one of the two. I think those names actually are real. And so this is the the invasion of Syracuse by the Romans. And um, of course, uh, Archimedes directs his mirror. Some say it was the shields of the soldiers. Some say it's just a legend. A lot of written about this, so I won't try to try to go back into the the history of the legends. But interestingly enough, and of course, the Roman ships caught fire. And so here's an example. Uh, a historical example, at least maybe it's somewhat legendary, but what's called a historical of actually burning ships with some kind of reflectors. And that isn't that hard to do, even with reflectivity of brass or copper at that time period. There were no silvered mirrors then. I'll come to silvering processes later. No silvering mirrors at that time. Uh, but he actually set some ships on fire. This legend says that. And um, the the Romans uh, said, oh, my God, we got 
Archimedes again. They wanted to capture him alive. But uh, some Roman soldier with a Roman sword shooter and Gladius ran him through and killed him while he was drawing circles from the sand. He said, don't disturb my circles. He was run through and killed. At least that's the legend, and I wasn't there to verify that. But I made up this little graphic, and, and there's Archimedes standing right up here. And um, and they wondered how he controlled it and how he made it work, and then he got that ship too. So, uh, you know, uh, interesting stuff. Now, uh, there was this thing called the Dark Ages, and if you study history, you can argue whether it occurred in the 4th or 5th century. We did have Byzantium. We did have some things still going on in Rome. There were other civilizations around the world that were doing very well. But somewhere in that time period, uh, about the 7th century or so, Islam rose. And one thing the, the, the Muslims did was they really liked learning. They were fascinated by the sky and astronomy. So they did some interesting things at Baghdad, Cairo, and Damascus. And um, when we were at Cairo, we, we toured the city and, and uh, just seen the pyramids. We also saw some very, very old buildings there that, uh, that date back uh, a, hundred, a thousand to two thousand years that are almost completely in ruin, but they're still there. It was a center of learning uh 1500 or 1300 years ago um syrians did glass blowing maybe even before it was done in venice uh, and there were a lot of stained glass things that were built in places like venice and murano which is the island where they built things like that in venice and then sometime along there although they did not have really didn't have the lenses they still built devices that were like sextants and octants and sundials astrolabes they had hourglasses uh other things like planispheres, those of you who have been in front of me had a planisphere, turn a little dial into the sky any time of the night. And I, one of my most prized possessions was my plastic planisphere I got from Edmund Scientific in about 1954, I think. So anybody have any old planispheres here? Or, they're a lot of fun. But they were built probably uh, very, very early um, after the, the common era began. Uh, now, you don't hear these names very often. You know, these names you're not familiar with, but these, all these people, Ulugh Bey, uh, Al-Hazan, did some amazing things in science and astronomy back uh, a thousand years ago or so. Um, there are telescope precursors that I mentioned earlier that are, I think, very important because there were signs that, that telescopes were coming. They were very close by. They were very near. They were going to be here soon. And so there are precursors that you want to take a, a look at, and I think they're interesting. Um, Bacon, around 1270 or so, said some things about optics that were that were astonishing. I mean, he he obviously knew things that no one else knew at the time. Um, it's, it's amazing. And then Venetians were building glass. They came from from Byzantium, which went to went to, later became Istanbul and, and and Constantinople, and and they they and also the Venetians were building glass by the 10th century which is about the time of St. Mark's Cathedral in, in Venice, um, 9th to 10th century. They were actually making glass then, and they flourished in the 13th century, and they built a lot of wonderful glass called Cristallo. Um, another milestone and a precursor of telescopes, I think important, one is spectacles. So, you know, you ask yourself, we had spectacles uh, around 1280 A.D., why don't we have telescopes about that time? You just put a positive lens here and a negative lens there, or if you want an upright image, you put a positive lens, positive lens here, and you get, a ver you get an inverted image. Why didn't anybody notice that? It kind of, it's kind of amazing to me, particularly when Bacon said it could be done. And then, we, of course, we got Copernicus and Tycho, Tycho Brahe, and these guys here, you know, you ever heard of Diggies, Borne, and Della Porta? I think, actually, there's a, there's a Della Porta High School in Naples, I believe. I think that's one there. But these guys, you never hear about them. You just don't hear about these guys. And so they had ideas about telescopes that were amazingly, amazingly near the truth, amazingly. So uh, Roger Bacon, now I'll give you time to read this. And if all of you here are familiar with telescopes, otherwise you wouldn't be interested in astronomy, probably, and vice versa. So if you read this, um, it sounds like Roger Bacon had a telescope concept around 1270. This is not to be confused with Sir Francis Bacon much, much later. Uh, he wasn't much into astronomy, I don't think. Maybe into ocean navigation, but not astronomy so much. 
So you ask your question, this is the right idea. This guy had the right idea. He was so close to having, the whole world would be changed. We'd have astronomy with telescopes 340 years earlier than we do, but it didn't work out. It, wasn't, it just wasn't quite the right time. Now, Leonard Diggies, now it's 300 years later. So it, it, it's amazing to me that even in the Renaissance, which began 1450-ish, probably in the area around Florence, um, why didn't anyone come up with the idea of a telescope? And I can't answer that question. It just didn't seem to happen. It just did not seem to happen. But if you read what it says here, uh, you'll find that it looks like what he's talking about is something that would be, be a telescope. And this, of course, is mirrors, so this would be a reflecting telescope. So Leonard Diggies had an idea about reflecting telescopes in 1571, but yet no telescope. Right idea, wrong time. And this guy, when I visited uh, and I gave that talk in Naples uh, at, at Pozzuoli, that's the, the University of Naples has, has a campus there, and that's where I gave the, the talk, kind of geared to the Italians at the time. So uh, Jim Battista della Porta in 1589, only slightly after Leonard Deggies, said that glass, he talks about glass and a concave glass and a, uh, a convex glass, and so this is a telescope. This man is describing a telescope. There's no question about it. And these writings are supposed to be pretty exact. Uh, in the book uh, by Henry C. King, he quotes these, and I think they're pretty close to the actual wording, translated, of course, from the Italian. He didn't say this in English. So uh, it looks like he had the right idea, but probably, again, the wrong time. So all these people did this wonderful work in very early optics and all the early astronomers and navigators and, and, and the wonderful scientists of 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years ago just didn't come up with a telescope. So uh, kind of like uh, the Internet and the computers, telescopes exploded into this thing. They literally went boom, and there they were. One day there was no telescope, and the next day there was a telescope. And it happened that quickly. Now, you couldn't get the word around Europe that fast because they didn't have Internet and telephones. And, you know, they, they had to travel along the roads, and, the, and, the, and they, they could have used mirrors to flash signals, but it took a while for it to get down to Italy. But it, it happened very, very quickly. On, on the scale of that time period, it's, it's amazing how fast it happened. And it all seems to come down to Hans Lippershey, Zacharias Janssen, and James Mateus, all in the same year. That's like competition, you know. That's, these guys are saying, hey, i got to hit that first. Like, my scope has to be one inch bigger than the other guy's scope. You know, it, it's competition and pride. And so these guys were fighting over it. And um, on October the 2nd, 1608, uh, remember that date because that is the date history tells us that a patent was applied for by this man, Hans Lippershey, for a device for seeing at a distance. Now, what does telescope mean? Scope means to see. Scope, scopus. Tele is, you know, is the prefix for it at a distance or long way away or far away. And so that's for seeing far away. But he didn't call it a telescope. In fact, they were called Dutch trunks, prospectus, psyllium, instrumentum, and cylinders. Sometimes they were called Dutch cylinders. And they were a wonder of the world at that time for a few months. And so here's the actual petition that was submitted uh, by Hans Lippershey. And now I think it's kind of interesting because us military guys like to see, um, they thought it might be good for military work. I think at the time, uh, Holland was at war with Spain, maybe Charles to something or other. And so they thought it'd be good for watching Spanish ships coming over the horizon, identifying them maybe a half hour, hour earlier than the, those without the scopes, and they wanted it. And they said, well, well, how about making it a binocular? And so the binocular and the telescope were both mentioned in the same patent and in the patent response. Uh, he all, they also asked, uh, somebody form a committee. You know, I love committees. So uh, they had to have a committee evaluate this thing. And this, again, this is uh, 1608. This is over 400 years ago. And then they had to find out what remuneration would be, would be necessary. So you got to get paid for the work you do. Like I do sometimes get paid for the stuff I do. And I, you know, I appreciate that, obviously. Uh, it's the right idea, right idea because he's, he's basically got it. 
And then, so there's some, there's some rumor that maybe he heard this from an Italian soldier who may have had the idea before, before Lippershe, or some people say that it was one of his apprentices in his shop that, gosh, this, I can think things closer. And uh, Lippershe, of course, hopped on it like a duck on a June bug and then decided it was going to be his idea. So whatever you, whatever you want to choose, um, it happened. And so there's the idea. And uh, there is your long focus positive lens, which could be a spectacle, you know, could be an eyeglass. And there's your short focus negative lens. Now that needs to be your shorter focus than this because otherwise you'll have a magnification of less than one. That's not too useful. So the idea being that put these things together and uh, Liberté also did something that's very important. He came up with the idea for something else. Hmm. We could use a tube. And so all telescopes have tubes today pretty much. Open truss tubes, closed truss tubes, long tubes, short tubes, metal tubes, fiberglass tubes, uh, epoxy tubes, graphite. You know, they have tubes of some kind because you've got to hold the two things in relative position pretty accurately. And so, sure enough, uh, the idea of a tube came along, and then it looks like to me we got a telescope. I've been talking for about 35 minutes, and we got the telescope. So, <sighs> I feel better already. And so, Eureka. To go back and quote Archimedes from 211, 212 BC, give him credit. He said that supposedly when he discovered the uh, Archimedes principle having to do with buoyancy. Um, and then we have the telescope. And so, right idea, right time, finally. So, uh, after 35 minutes or so, we have the telescope. And um, I think somewhere here, Galileo comes in because Galileo was the guy that really used this new invention for astronomy. And, and it, 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 I don't know why it wasn't used by Liberté for astronomy or Hans Matthias or the Italian soldier, but obviously Galileo had the mind power and the interest and the brain power to do it, and he did it. And so we have Galileo spyglasses. Now, those of you who build telescopes, and like I said, I've been doing that for a long time, uh, magnification of the first scopes is about 3x, which is about what you see in a Galilean binocular. And 8x, which is what you see in a prismatic binocular. And then you got the 10, 20, and 30, which is a small telescope. And uh, so 30x scopes, we could see a lot of stuff. And uh, resolution, we don't know for sure, but I, I consulted a couple of Italians about, about this when I was at Naples, the university. I came to the conclusion that maybe it was probably about 10 to 15 arc seconds. Uh, debatable, but that's what we think it was. And I think that's probably a good number. Now, the human eye can see about... About what? What? What can human eye? A good human eye can resolve something around one arc minute. Uh, if your eye is not quite so good, if you're a victim of presbyopia, like some of us here are, are falling falling victim to, it may only be two or three arc minutes. But so he was able to see uh, four to six times better than any human eye in the world, which of course in itself was an amazing accomplishment. And he found craters on the moon. Pots on the sun, the moons of Jupiter, the Galilean moons of Jupiter, phases of Venus. He said the star, Milky Way may be made out of stars. You know, might knew that. But he never figured out Saturn. Kept looking at Saturn. And, and from 1610 to 1630 or 1640, you cannot imagine the number of drawings of Saturn. I mean, there were, because it's always changing, the planes are going back and forth, the 11 year cycle or whatever it is. They're going to do it this way. And so sometime they're aligned, they disappear. And if people say, well, that wasn't that way three months ago. There were little balls on the end. So he didn't figure it out, and he was dead before it was figured out. But it's amazing. So now, when did the telescope really come into being? Well, apparently it was a banquet for Galileo in Rome, and there's the date of it. It's recorded in history. And um, uh, Frederick Sissi referred to his instrument as a telescope. And then the word telescope or telescopium uh, was used in a, a book by Lagala. Uh, called Lunar Phenomena, and it was described to this man in Cephalonia. I don't know what he's doing in Cephalonia, but that's what the that's what the story says. So it looks like that we do have the telescope. Now we had it before. We had it three years before, four years before, but it wasn't called a telescope. But now we have it. 1612. It's definitely called a telescope, and it's been called a telescope ever since. Now, <sighs> take a break for a second. Now, are there any questions? I'm not sure I can answer them, but. This is the time for any questions about ancient history of astronomy, the development of telescope, telescope precursors, or whatever.
What's that? I suspect he did a projection experiment. Otherwise, he might have damaged his eye. Um, and he can do a projection experiment with just a single lens. The telescope, if you try to project it, it makes an afocal image. So, But if you unfocus the two lenses, he could have done that too. Or, or maybe he put a smoked glass in front of it. I, I don't know. A good question on the answer. Smoked glasses were common in those days. You could put a glass, piece of glass in the fire, and it would get smoky and dark, and you could look at the sun through it. I'm not sure if he did that, but maybe so. But maybe he did that. But he was the one credited with seeing sunspots. And he, I think either by projection or by diminution of the light, one of those two processes. He didn't have any film, couldn't do a photograph, you know. So, so that's, that's a good question. Uh, but that's probably what happened. So, uh, any other questions uh, about that time period and era and how telescopes came around and things? Okay, well, great. And uh, I guess a good question, and I wonder about that myself because I wasn't aware that Galileo was totally blind when he's in his later years, so he probably didn't look at the sun too much. Now, let's talk about evolution of the telescope. Um, long focus refractors were, were big in the beginning. From 1620 to 1670, they got bigger and bigger and bigger. The longer the, magnif longer the scope, the bigger the magnification. And it became trendy. And socially correct to have the longest telescope. And so a lot of guys were trying, to, my telescope is five feet long. Well, Joe's got a telescope that's 10 feet long. Well, Bill's putting one that's 20 feet long. Well, I've got one that's 40 feet long. And it went crazy. And I'm always amazed by these enormous refractories people were building this. And I visited Danzig, which is, you know, the uh, Gdansk, which is Danzig of, of old. And I wondered where Helvetius' great scope was. Newton came along later and, and built some very small, compact scopes. That actually worked pretty well. In fact, one of his had a 35x magnification. And so he had to make them out of, we didn't have optical glass then really, not quite. And so he made them out of a, mirror, a material called speculum or copper or bell metal. And they were polished by rubbing them together, kind of like, kind of like I did when I was a kid making telescope mirrors. And Cass Cassegrain came along. We mentioned the Gregorian. Uh, the other guys made some, this guy, Molyneux, probably a Frenchman, made some wonderful mirrors out of speculum. Speculum has some bad things. It has like arsenic in it and copper and tin and, and other stuff that's not too good to breathe. So a lot of the people were making these mirrors and heating up these elements and making them, firing them in the forwards. They probably didn't do too well. They probably got arsenic in their systems and they may have died early because of that. Uh, Donzig 1660-ish. Uh, here the great Havidius is preparing his telescope. And uh, people would come around the village and take their beer steins because uh, that area had beer even in 1600. 16, beer is pretty old. And uh, they'd bring their beer and their wives and family and their cats and their dogs and their children. They all gather around to watch the videos in his telescope. And um, worked just fine until somebody uh, basically remembered, you got to move the thing. <laughs> Now, do the math. I mean, a telescope that's 150 feet long, an eyepiece, which is an inch or two in diameter, uh, the field of view is pretty simple to calculate. It's an inch, it's one part in 12, 1,250, 1,800, so the field of view is going to be something in the order of a 30th of a degree, which is, you know, something in the order of a 15th of diameter of the full moon. Uh, super small field of view, so you had to be very accurate in pointing and control. And uh, these things were rigged up on ropes and towers and and um, he'd been given the command to move it, and somebody nearby says, don't stand too close, a very wise pronouncement from someone that somebody there. And sure enough, probably more, more occasion than one, a little wind would blow, and the thing would snap, and it would crash down, and, and um, the whole thing would be out of order for two or three months, so it got rebuilt. And uh, interesting because um, apparently Havilius also ran the brewery, in town, and, and uh, the northern plains of Poland do have some grain, and you can grow the grains and whatever you need to make beer. And so he probably made money, more money on beer and telescopes. But Huygens' idea was an airy telescope called an airy, and he put a lens up here and a pillar, and down here he put another thing with a rope of some kind. He just kind of lined them up. He didn't have that 100-foot-long tube. And so Huygens ended up being the guy finally to decipher the the, moon, the uh, rings of Saturn. 
So sometime after Galileo was dead, the rings of Saturn were, oh my God, those are rings. So that's the amazing thing, I think. Now, Newton was a, an amazing individual, and uh, I've always thought that Newton was uh, one of the greatest physicists and scientists of all time, and I believe that's quite true. Newtonian physics, Newtonian optics. Uh, but he made, a, he, made, he made one classic mistake. He, he put a prism up, built a device, and said, gosh, that's interesting. And so this is how the thing kind of went, probably. Once he saw that dispersion, he said, wait a minute, you know, refractors can only be so good because of dispersion. The light doesn't come to the same place for different wavelengths. And that's very bad because you get chromatic aberration, and that's horrible. You get a big color blur, and you can't see anything. And that's why refractors at that time period roughly were 100 feet long because the chromatic ab aberration gets much, much less as the focal length is much, much longer. So uh, I, I commented this, this um, cat may have been interested in, in uh, the apple. Uh, that's just a little serendipitous thing I threw in there. So that's a picture of me when I had a beard over there. Um, and so refractors just have to wait for DeLonde and in my collection of old, I have several DeLon, I don't have a front hover, I have several DeLon refractors in my collection. And uh, they go back to 1780, 1790, 1820. So DeLon was in England, and he, he did some interesting work in acrobatism. And again, it's said that one of his, perhaps one of his um, apprentices discovered that if you put a crown glass and a flint glass together with the right curves, you can correct chromatic aberration. So that was a big deal. Now, these guys all did wonderful things over the years, uh, and there was this telescope built by Fraunhofer, who was an optical genius. I think perhaps, in my opinion, he may have been the first true optical genius. That's debatable, but Fraunhofer was amazing. He built the great Dorpat ref refractor, a nine and a half inch aperture, 14 foot focal length, and a German equatorial mount, and um, people, people who saw it said it was amazing. The mechanical quality, the optical quality, the slewing, the equatorial mount, the, the, the correction of chromatic aberration. I actually made a six-inch refractor back probably in the 60s or so that had the Fraunhofer pattern uh, correcting for B and F light versus C and F light, and uh, it worked just fine. And I had it super coated by a friend at Perkin Elmer, and it became an important telescope that we used at the Ast Astronomical Society in Dayton, Ohio, for two or three years, and I, I built that scope. The optics, the mechanics, the mount that drives everything. And that was back in about 1964. So Fraunhofer did some good stuff a long time ago. <laughs> and then, of course, William Struve and his astronomy, uh, I think he used the door pad, and then they got bigger over the years. And then we had better glasses and achromatic doublets. An achromatic doublet corrects for two colors of light. An, an apochromatic doublet corrects for three colors of light. And an aplanatic doublet corrects for coma which is very important off-axis. So people were developing this stuff, and, and Cook built a refractor. And then the Clarks came along, and they built some wonderful scopes. And uh, I own a, a small Clark objective that I bought at auction somewhere for enough money to buy a car. But I wanted one, so I went ahead and bought it. If you don't get what you want when you got a chance, you never get it anyway. So I spent a little money on that. And uh, I visited some of these scopes. And uh, the biggest I ever made, except for one for an expedition in Paris around 1900 was the 40-inch Yerkes scope. Still around today, still the world's largest refractor. Uh, Herschel came along and did some wonderful stuff, and he actually discovered Uranus with one of his scopes. So Herschel was an um, interesting guy. And then I guess uh, uh, Car Caroline Herschel, I think it was Caroline, was his sister. And, and she did some work with him, and so she wasn't necessarily the first female astronomer, but she was one of the earliest, and a lot of Herschel's work, it, it, it was done with, with, with Caroline, and of course, there is more than one Herschel in the family, you know, be a little careful, but the 48 inch, it's this big around. Now, Herschelian telescope's an interesting property. He didn't want to build secondary mirrors. He didn't want to build diagonal, so he, what he'd actually do is stick his head in the tube and look down the tube and look at the image with an eyepiece, and so he blocked out part of the image, and so Herschelian telescopes do that. They block out part of the light. You can get away with that with a four-foot scope, not with a six-inch scope, because you block out the entire image. Uh, Lord Ross, whoa, my God. Lord Ross came along a little later and, and did some wonderful scopes. And he built 
This scope, the Leviathan of Parsonstown, uh, Lord Ross was also the third Earl of Parsons in Ireland, and that and I used to work with Parsons and Grubb Parsons in England when they were still around building telescopes. They built the Herschel telescope, the Newton telescope, other telescopes. I was honored to work with some of those guys, not not uh, the Earl of Parsons, but some of the people that ran the plant. They don't make telescopes anymore. They they make something else now, elevators or something. But that telescope was amazing. Probably had a half an arc second resolution. It was the biggest telescope in the world for 72 years. That is amazing to me to have. You made the biggest scope in the world for 72 years. Nobody made anything any bigger. And there, of course, is the third Earl of Parsons with Lord Ross. Uh, he appeared on some painting. Um, I've got a lot of attention with this chart. I made this chart probably 20 years ago for a talk I gave on big optics. And it's interesting to note that the aerial density, or the density of the primary mirror, not the whole telescope, uh, measured in, in kilograms per meter square, kind of stayed the same for close to 200 years. They were always around around 1,000 a a thousand kilograms or 2,200 pounds per, per square meter. And they didn't change much. Herschel, Ross, Lassell, Melbourne, which was a speculative metal mirror, Lassell, Mount Wilson, you know, they all stayed the same. The two point, the 100 uh, the inch, the 60 the inch, all about the same because they were solid mirrors. And then sometime here around 1960 or so, um, there was an explosion of lightweight optics. I was lucky enough to work on that with the Air Force on lots of programs. And I used to run lightweight optics programs for the Air Force for, for several years. And uh, we helped develop that technology. And why did we want to develop that technology? We're putting things where? In space. And what does it cost to put things up in space? A lot of money. And so if you can make them lighter and smaller, they're going to be easier to launch, and they won't take as much launch power, and they won't have as much inertia to move around and point. And so that was why we developed lightweight mirrors. There were a few developed before the Air Force did it, you know, a few. And uh, an Italian built a lightweight mirror back probably in the 30s or 40s, but not, not much happened with them. So all of a sudden, we just went crashing down. We had MMT, Hubble Space Telescope, Keck, uh, HET. These telescopes from here were all down to about 200 kilograms per square meter. Then we had LAMP, Large Aperture Mirror Project, LOF, large number seven, a lot. These were all around 60 or 70. AMSD, which I worked on with NASA, which was a precursor to the James Webb Space Telescope. That was down around uh, 20. And then we, the mirror only had to be under 10. And we act, I, I didn't do it, but the people that I worked with did it. And uh, what's going up in James Webb is actually, the, it's, it's brilliant. Not glass. The, the, the ULE lost out because in the chamber in Huntsville, when they cycled it in the thermal IR, it didn't do as well as the brilliant mirror. It was better in the visible, but when they did it, the cycling in the IR, it didn't. It has something called hysteresis. And those of you who know mechanical engineering know hysteresis, so I won't comment on that. But uh, so they, they chose the brilliant mirror, and uh, it became. It was a large. Aperture Space Telescope, and it became the Hubble, well, actually it became um, the James Webb Space Telescope. I actually met James Webb many years ago when I was running the optics lab at at, uh, at uh, Kirtland, and I took him on a tour through the optics lab. And that's probably been 35 or 40 years ago, I guess, but I uh, got to meet James Webb of the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, this is the inner segment for a big scope that the military worked on. And uh, we did that in one segment, and I was the advisor. For, it was made at NITEC Corporation back in Boston. And this is the four-meter annulus, and the other sections were made the whole mirror about 11 meters in aperture. And uh, that was a project that finally got canceled. And, and then, of course, some of the people, you know, uh, Rich Contreras, you know, you know, Rich at the lab, He's worked some on, on uh, membrane inflatable mirrors. And Aiden Minnell, even 30, 40 years ago, did some membrane mirrors. And when I was at Wright Pet 50 years ago, a guy came in with a mirror that was a soap soap bubble mirror. It actually was a, a, a piece of, of um, a plastic he, he drew down under a vacuum and locked the vacuum behind with an O-ring and brought it in. And one of our guys said, if I touch it, poof, it blew up when he touched it. So they weren't very successful in 1960s. But membrane mirrors are amazing. Of course, they can get down to one kilogram per square meter. The membrane is much less than that. 
but you got to hold it and mount it and put it in a ring of some kind or a bezel. So anyway, now milestones, uh, time is probably about over. So diffraction theory, Young, Fraunhofer, Herschel, Fresnel diffraction. Uh, the silvering process, until this time, until about 1850, we were still using metal mirrors. Big, heavy things, 6, 8, 10 grams per cubic centimeter density. Very heavy, and they only had a maximum of 50% reflectivity. So you could polish them, you could polish them forever, and they never get any brighter because they didn't have much more than 50-60% reflectivity. Of course, silver inherently is higher, but they didn't make a lot of silver mirrors because silver is soft and it moves around. Um, but these guys built this. Bashir's process, I worked with Bashir for many years. I have a copy of the original first edition of Bashir's book. He died in 1920, and the company was taken over by a guy named Fecker. Warner and Swayze in Cleveland, and Fecker, of course, found J.W. Fecker Incorporation, which became Contrabage, which became Brashear, and now brought out by L3. So the evolution of these telescope places is amazing, and I, I'm kind of a walking encyclopedia of telescope evolution. A lot of fun. Who here has used the Foucault knife test? Some of you have. I mean, I built the tester in 54 or something and used it to make all my mirrors. Took those mirrors back, by the way, to Contrabage about 10 or 15 years ago and put them on interferometer. And all of them were better than lambda, four, lambda, lambda over 40. So even at the age of 15 and 20, like some of, the, of our, our young folks back here, I was making mirrors that were very, very good uh, just by using the Foucault test. You know, so it can be done. This was the last great speculum mirror. And um, one of the former directors, Lewis Hyde, University of Rochester, who I knew and met in the 60s. He's, he's gone now. He wrote a nice paper on the disaster of the Great Melbourne Telescope. He was caught in a transition. There were more and more glass mirrors, and he said, I'm going to make a speculum mirror. So the whole thing was a disaster. And within a few years, we were making 40 and 50 inch glass mirrors that were 10 times better. And uh, Lewis Hyde wrote that up. And the disaster, I, the actual title is The Calamity of the Great Melbourne Telescope. And I thought he was sitting in Melbourne when I first said it, but it's Melbourne Telescope. Uh, 1862, uh, photography came along. We have uh, daguerreotypes, solar images, colloidians, lunar photography, first Ryan Nebula the photograph, 1880. Of course, M42 is pretty bright. It's one of the brighter, bright, bright nebulas. It's easy to photograph, and that was done 138 years ago. And then we have the re continued refinement of the, of the photographic and the explosion of digital detectors, and I'm not a detector guy much, and so um, that's also kind of like the telescope explosion because today everything is digital. How many still have, own, and use film cameras? Okay. I still have my Lycoflexes and my Nikon F4 and F5 and my Pentax Spotmatics. And, I, and I, have a, I have a freezer full of Fuji uh, Vel, Velvia, which I still love, Fujichrome Velvia. It's a great film. After using Kodak for years, I, and I worked with Kodak for many, many projects, but I went to Fuji Velvia, that's like the saturation, but have not used it. Last time I used it was in, it was in Egypt with a, with a Voigtlander with a 12 millimeter lens. I got these 130 degree fields of view for filling the pyramids and things. And that was 2010. Yeah, yeah that was right before the Arab Spring. You know, just, my host over there was, was, was killed. His wife was, was shot at and, uh, and the family was, was during the, the uprising there in Cairo. But he actually was killed in a car crash. But it was a wonderful guy, and I miss him because he took me all over Egypt, and they were very nice people. Um, spectroscopy, the polishing machines, equatorial mounts, commons mount. This is the great invention, the photo triplet by Cook. Uh, the first really high-quality, anomaly wide field of view system. And then, of course, the 100-inch telescope. Uh, was the biggest scope in the world until the the, uh, the Palomar scope came out. So from 1917, 1918 to 1950, biggest scope in the world. But there was a big scope up in Canada I visited once, uh, in Vancouver. Anyone been able to see that scope in Vancouver at the Dominion Astrophysical Observatory in, in Vancouver? That's a great scope, too. And it was the biggest scope in the world for like a week, I think, <laughs> before the, 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 Mount, the Mount Wilson scope was done. Interferometry, you all know about Michelson. Michael was a Navy guy, by the way, and a uh, very, very bright Navy guy. So some of the military people that I work with, and maybe not me, but some of them actually are pretty bright. And 
make some great discoveries. So Michelson did the interferometer. That's been almost 100 years ago. And, oh, I love Russell Porter. I, I tried to buy a Russell Porter painting at an auction one time. It's twice got of 30 or 40,000. I was going to buy it anyway. And then all of a sudden I said, Russell W. Porter's painting has been removed from the auction to be sent to a museum. And so, ah, oh, I didn't get the, um, the Russell. He also was a wonderful artist. He did polar expeditions. Uh, he was, you know, with Bird and Perry and Am Amundsen, and he, that amazing guy. Of course, this is really, really, really important. Schmidt's camera. The first high-quality, curved feel, but high-quality, um, re reflective, refractive system with a wonderful Schmidt plate. And if you read about Bernard Schmidt, he was a fascinating guy. Uh, he was kind of a, of a hermit and uh, a recluse. And he always wore a kind of a black top coat, and he had he had an arm missing, and I wondered why. So I read up in the book, and it said that he liked to play with gunpowder. And when he blew his arm off with gunpowder, his greatest fear was his, his mother would be upset because he he, he damaged his suit. So uh, uh, Schmidt was an interesting guy. He chain smoked cigars, wore a big long black coat, but he was a master of optical design and fabrication. And you know about the 200 inch and the Soviet telescope. And then, of course, up now we have Dekist up the hill here, and um, Kit Peak, Sack Peak, Celestats. You know, Celestat comes from the word Cela or Kole, which means uh, sky. Stat, stasis, statum, standstill. So, Celestat, sky standstill. Heliostat is sun standstill. Sidereostat is star standstill. And uh, they're around the world. In fact, we put a big Celestat in at the SOR, and um, the Scott Hunt here is aware of that one out the SOR. Uh, that, by the way, is one of the biggest ever built in the world. That's the Heidel and the Verona for both one meter aperture celestats with 1.5 meter <laughs> aperture turning flats. Do the math, one meter times square meter two is 1.414, so you need one and a half meter turning flats. Uh, optical glass has is, is been so important. We now have glass which has 0 0.00000000 000 000 000 000 000 000 000 000 000 uh, one uh, expansion per degree C, and that's amazing. And um, coatings, uh, I just went over and saw the coating chamber here. Uh, Dr. Armstrong was kind enough to show me the coating chamber. And I read the lab at right back at Kirtland. We had a chamber very much like that, plus a, a 40 inch and a 60 inch and a 100 inch chamber. So the chamber here looks like a really good, high-quality chamber, and I guess they're going to do some coating work on it soon. It takes about a 20-inch mirror or so, and that's a nice little chamber. Of course, I had that when I was putting in telescopes. And, of course, lasers came along in 1960-ish, and um, I was building scopes five years before lasers came along, or six, seven years, actually. And so I like to have a laser interferometer, but I just stuck with the old Jean Foucault, Foucault's Foucault tester. Lightweight mirrors and structures, computer design, space telescopes, X-ray telescopes, the future, et cetera, and taxonomy. I'll just walk through these. Oh, you fixed it. J.D., you in here? Is there, yeah, this, this slide was, was superimposed. He fixed it. So uh, I had these all animated, but I knew that I was going to run over time by seven, eight minutes here. So I'll, I'll go really quickly. But these are all animated, and they have the ray pass and all, but I decided it was too crazy, so I took out all the animations. So here's Keplerian telescope. Or CNA focal telescope, two versions, the Gregorian and the Cassegrain version, the Cassegrain classic telescope, Gregorian telescope classic, Newtonian telescope with a diagonal fold. Herschelian tele remember, see, the Herschelian telescope, you've got to get over here. So they move the lens a little bit out of the field of view, so if you don't have a big head, you can get in there to see the image. And uh, refracting telescopes, you know, Fraunhofer, Steinhal, Clark, standard, cemented, non cemented airspace, Flint first. The last one kind of has a version of a uh, of an apochromatic Schmidt camera. Now, why is this called a camera rather than a telescope? Because you can't get your head in here to see the image. It's inside the telescope tube. So it really is a camera. And Schmidt admitted it as a camera, not a telescope. He, he wanted a camera, and he built a camera. He has a curved field of view. Uh, this is a short Schmidt, which is a little shorter than the regular Schmidt because you don't have to put the corrector plate at the front radius of the curvature of the, of the, of the primary mirror. Schmidt cast. Now, who's got Celestrons and Meads and all those things? There's some variant of this, you know, some variant more or less of this kind of a telescope. Max Hattal, anybody here? I've got a Quest star at home, and I've got a Quantum 4. 
And uh, anybody here have a Quest Star or Quantum, Quantum Four? If you have the Quest Star, it's a classic Mass uh, Maxitoff. And this is an inverted Quest Star, which is a Gregorian variant of a Bowers Maxitoff. Now Bowers actually also kind of invented this same time the Russians did, so it should almost probably be called the Bowers Maxitoff because they both had the idea kind of the same time. Double Cassegrain, never see these. Double bounce Cassegrain. Baker Super Schmidt, I was fortunate enough to work with Jim Baker on many projects, and he was a, a wonderful, maybe the greatest optical designer of all time, in my opinion, and a wonderful guy. Baker Meinl, Baker Gray, Dave Gray was a great designer, very, very bright guy. Off axis scopes. Now, I left this animation in, I think, so you can see what's going on here. Light comes in there, then goes down to there, then comes down to there. And uh, that's that's what you use. You don't use the rest of it. Gets kind of thrown away. Sheath Spiegler's CHTs, folded bent scopes, tri sheath Spiegler's quad sheath Spiegler's centered designs, eccentric designs, three mirror telescopes. This is called a walrus wide angle, large aperture, reflecting, unobscured system. I think Hughes invented that. Uh, you can't build them because you can't align them. I mean, it, it, they they have no. <laughs> I guess you could align it, but it would take you. You know, if you if you move one mirror, it'd take six scientists a month to realign it. Now, no, no time for this, but here are the classic uh, mounts you see. German fork, polar disc, horseshoe, English yoke, elevation of that. These are, these are uh, or tracking gimbals. Uh, this actually here is actually kind of similar to the SOR 1.5 or the A-focalizing beam compactor, which actually changes the the, the um, the beam from uh, four or five inches to about two inches, which of course in increases the magnification but lowers the field of view. Uh, this is an out out system. We've got a few of those around. And um, nice thing about this is it has no singularity at the zenith. So you can, you can watch satellites go through the zenith with this thing. Whereas otherwise, if you're watching satellites go through the zenith with a reg regular LRS, you go like this. And you got to go, whoa, over here like that. But otherwise, you don't have to do that with a, with a, with an altazimuth mount. See the stats of various kinds. References and sources. Um, I, I've gathered these references over the years, and I won't comment on them too much. Um, there's some papers in here, actually by me, amazingly enough. And uh, uh, I think those are my papers. Um, and then people I've, I've communicated with on this talk over the years, a lot of them are dead, Amram Katz. Uh, Jim Baker, the Minels, and other folks. And uh, now, it's over. Um, Joe Janai was uh, the guy that said, "This is a great group of people. You got to go and meet them. They're 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 smart. They're bright. They're interested. They're wonderful. You got to give a talk to them." And he taught me into doing it. So I give Joe uh, credit for that. And uh, maybe Tyen, maybe has some credit, uh, possibly. And J.D. for putting this whole thing together with me, putting on his laptop, making it all work. And I probably couldn't do that. I'd probably mess it up. He did it. And then, of course, my company, the DOD folks, AFRL, who's been funding a lot of my work for several years. Uh, my my former admin assistant and secretary, Gloria, who did, she's typed up probably a thousand of my papers and reports, literally. Pat Cavaney did a lot of these graphics. He's a great guy to work with. And then SPOS, AOSC, AOS, NOA, Ensemble, DOD, UCF, AFRL, ABL, ABL. <laughs> we all worked with the years. And finally, to my mentors, mine, little Baker, Rudy Kingflake, one of the founders of the Institute of Optics in Rochester, uh, Roland Shack, a good friend, a uh, great guy, and Carl Safert, the astronomer, Safert's success, Safert's galaxy, worked with him in Dyer Observatory, Harlow Shapley, who I only met and worked with one time, working with the Hard College, college Observatory programs. Dan Franklin was a great mathematician. James Wyant, you know Jim Wyant. He's the founder of the College of Optical Sciences. He's the, he's the founder of the college, founder of the university, or the, the, the Optical Sciences Center was, of course, Aiden Minel. Uh, Amram Katz, the guy that did the photometry of the invasions of, of uh, North Korea, the Inchon photometry, a very famous photometrist, and um, photogrammetrist, actually, and a good guy, one of the original guys at Rand Corporation that said we can put optics in space. Amram Katz, 1940s and early 50s. Uh, Lou Bruckner and others and uh, mentors and associates and et cetera, and that's it. <laughs> so, thank you.
Uh, now, there may be one minute for questions. I don't know if there's anything else that you want to know, or I might know the answer, I might not, but uh, I'm willing to say yes. Well, um, one of the problems was that, that those big spectrum mirrors, um, they, they would break. And I think that um, Lord Ross probably broke a lot of spectrum mirrors. And so just like big refractors kind of stopped at 40 inches because of the inability to make bigger lenses at high quality and low, stri low, stri low strain, I think probably the question is, is an excellent question. I think probably they just didn't know how to make a big respect in the mirror. Uh, the, the content, the arsenic, the, the tin, the, 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 the copper, getting the, the thing right, they would frequently break even at 30 or 40 inches and they cool down. They would break when they were cool because the stresses, it's called hoop stresses, you know, hoop stresses in a mirror. Hoop stresses in a mirror, you got this band on the outside and that gets stressed because it's sitting right beside air and right inside is the material. So that, that boundary level there, if you do the, the equations of stress and strain, and I'm not going to go into all that, but if you do that equation, those equations, you'll find that you have a stress riser. It goes up very high there. And so the crack would initiate typically somewhere near the edge and go through the whole mirror. And sometimes the center would be a problem too. Uh, but the, the, the answer to the question, I think, probably is that they just couldn't make any bigger mirrors. Now, when they got glass... Uh, by 1917, which was the, the first mirror, that and the one up in the 72-inch up in uh, Vancouver, they, they had glass processes for making bigger mirrors. But the first one they did for uh, Panama broke, you know. And they went with few silica, and that didn't work. And then they, had, they made a 1-point, uh, they made a 120-inch uh, sample, and that became the Lick Observatory Telescope, the Lick, the Shane Telescope. And finally, they poured the 200-inch. And, uh, and then, of course, the Russians did the 236, and they had a nightmare of a problem with making a monolithic 236-inch mirror. And so glass mirrors, uh, solid glass mirrors kind of died somewhere around five or six meters. And then when you go to lightweight mirrors, like the Splencast mirrors at Arizona or the lightweighted mirrors that Schott makes and ULE mirrors that Corning makes up at the Canton plant in New York, those uh, are very lightweight and they can manage the thermal control better. In those days, uh, I mean, even thermometers were kind of uncommon, you know, and so a thermometer that would measure the temperature of melted metal at 2,000 degrees or 1,200 degrees, they didn't have a way to do it. They had no IR, they couldn't do tomography, and so they couldn't do effective heat treating, and heat treating is the key that is the key to, to making good mirrors. And when I was a consultant with the Germans on the first eight meter you know, a, a zero to a mirrors, I got called over. I went over there, inspected the mirror with the German team. They declared it a great success, and the next week it broke. And it, they broke two more. Uh, after that, they didn't advertise they had the biggest mirror in the world anymore until they had it fully ceramized. It's a two-phase process. Pouring it and cooling it and then ceramizing it, heating it back up and bringing it back down, and uh, let, they broke theirs too. You know, so it's probably the reason that they didn't have uh, bigger speculums, 90-inch speculums, because they were always breaking. Someone may have tried it, but they aren't going to say, you know, I, I broke my mirror and I spent hundred thousand dollars of the community money and uh, built this thing and it cracked. You know, so uh, okay. Anything else? Well, forgive my, uh, my uh, fast-talking uh, moments because uh, when I was a youngster, um, I talked so fast that it was almost impossible. It was just crazy. It was just crazy. <laughs> and I also mumbled. Not only did I talk fast, I mumbled. And so uh, in my senior year in college, I was a pretty bright kid, actually, amazingly enough. And so uh, my, speech, uh, my teacher said, you've got to go to speech therapy. So I went to speech therapy for one year. And uh, I had a tape recorder, and I played things back and forth. And I kind of learned to slow it down a little bit. But over the years, I've acquired some of my old talking fast and mumbling habits, so forgive me. But uh, OK, I thank you so much for coming. I'm <laughs> over time.